Okay, this is the second lecture for chapter four. Um, we're talking about electrons and the motion of electrons primarily. And so where we left off was looking at Bohr's experiments and some of the ways in which Bohr was correct and some of the ways in which Bohr was not correct. But um, about a decade or so after Bohr, um, a French scientist was doing some more work looking at electrons and he, uh, based on his experimentation, he described the motion of electrons as being similar to that of waves. We already knew and know now that electrons travel as individual kind of particles or that light travels as individual particles and that those particles follow a pretty distinct wave pattern. And de Broglie um, was this scientist's name. He described the motion of electrons as being very similar to that of light. Um, and in the sense that they um, exist within a defined space, that means they have um, particular regions where they can and cannot be. And they also move and kind of vibrate at certain frequencies. And those frequencies, as we saw from the Hertz equation, um, those frequencies correspond to specific energies at certain uh, measurable levels. Um, and we know that this is true now because there have been a variety of experiments, including the double slit, for instance, that shows that electrons follow um, patterns, w wave patterns, um, that can be bent. So let's say this electron is traveling here. Right? And it travels in such a way that when it hits an object, it can be reflected back, it can be refracted or bent, moved at a different angle. And that when multiple waves or multiple electrons in this instance overlap with one another, they show interference. Right here we've got what we saw in the video last week was referred to as const or pardon me, destructive interference. We've got a peak of one wave overlapping with the trough of another. And then we also saw examples of constructive interference where waves overlap such that their two peaks are found um, in the same region at the same time. That causes constructive interference, which produced in the double slit experiment at least, it produced a very bright light um, as opposed to a lack of light in the destructive interference. So some of the other um, experimentation that were happening during that time about experiments came from um, a couple of gentlemen named Heisenberg and Schrodinger. And the, the Heisenberg principle is one of my very favorites because it kind of seems to sum up chemistry for me at least. And what Heisenberg said was, really, we can never know with any kind of actual certainty where an electron can be found at any space in any time. Um, it's not possible to know both how quickly it's moving and where it happens to be at this exact instant because what we know about electrons all comes from experimentation where we shoot light and electricity and all kinds of other things at electrons. And what happens is the electron gets knocked off its course. It gets sent in different directions. So just the process of testing properties of the electron causes those properties to change. Um, and that led Heisenberg to draw the conclusion that it is never possible to know exactly where an electron is and know its velocity at the same time. And he called it the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. We just never really know. And I think that's hysterical. I love it. Um, Schrodinger's work actually led us to the field of quantum mechanics and quantum theory. And these are, are just a um, collection of, not just, but these are a collection of equations that mathematically describe the properties of electrons and other small particles. In particular, it describes the wave-like properties. And so what that has allowed us to do is to make a probability, essentially, that says at any given space and time, it is most likely that we can find an electron, say, within this large space. The electron or electrons for this element 
are most likely found somewhere within these borders. Whether that's right here or right here or right there or right there, we have no way to know. But we can say mathematically, it is very, very likely, I think the, per, you know, the percentage is in the 90s, it is that likely that the electron is somewhere in here right now. And that led to this idea called orbitals, which is a statistical way to describe the likelihood of finding an electron within a given area at a certain time. And so that whole idea of orbitals, um, again, it's a probability. There's no way to say with absolute certainty where the electrons are, but we do know now that the orbitals are very um, accurate in terms of statistics and that the likelihood of tracking down those electrons is pretty high. Um, and we describe orbitals in a bunch of different ways. Um, we use what are called quantum numbers. So quantum just refers to the energy level or the, the um, properties of the electron in particular. And then number just refers to the fact that every electron um, is unique to each atom or every number of electrons is unique to each atom. And so we describe it in a, a fairly unique manner. So the first kind of big way that we classify um, orbitals is to look at the main energy level. And a lot of times you'll see that described as a lowercase n, which is just a variable or you know a, a constant that we can um, use to describe how other properties relate to the main energy level of a particular electron. Um, this is also called the principal quantum number. So principal means the um, kind of primary, and then quantum again refers to the properties of that electron. And so the principal quantum number describes specifically the property of energy. It's always in whole numbers, so you start at energy level one. As you go up to energy level two, there's more energy. As you go up to energy level three, there's even more energy. And also, as you increase energy level, you get further and further from the nucleus. So if you think about the nucleus as being the kind of ground state or the ground floor of a flight of stairs, each step is one energy level, and so you're getting higher and higher in energy. You're also getting further and further from that initial landing. Um, we also describe orbitals in terms of shape. So the um, area in which you are likeliest to find an electron actually has a defined shape, which I thought as a student was really interesting. It's not totally random. The motion itself may be random, but the area in which that motion is taking place is fairly well defined. So think of this like a yard that has a particular shaped fence and the electron or say maybe the pet for that particular yard can be found anywhere within that yard, but it can't go outside the borders of the shape itself. Um, so sometimes you'll see this referred to as the angular momentum quantum number. We don't use that terminology very often. We mostly just use these abbreviations, these letter abbreviations that describe the shape of the orbital. So the S orbital right here is spherical or basically like a beach ball. Um, the P orbital is a kind of dumbbell shape or a figure eight, I guess, would be another way to look at it. Um, the D and F orbitals get a lot more complicated. The D orbital starts out looking like a four-leaf clover, most of the um, shapes, but there is one that's a little funky. It looks like a dumbbell with a um, kind of inner tube around its middle. And then the F shapes are even more kooky than that. I always think of F for flower. So there's a bunch of lobes going off in all different directions, and there's a variety of ways that that can appear. Um, the number of the energy level, so one or two or three, tells you how many shapes are possible at that energy level. So mean energy level one has one possible shape. Energy level two has two shapes. Energy level three, three different shapes, etc. So on and so forth. Um, two of the other ways that we can describe orbitals the um, next one is kind of an interesting thought. It's the orientation or the directionality of the shape. So again, remember the shapes are 
spherical, for instance, and dumbbell, right? So spherical can only be one orientation. No matter which angle you look at it from, it always looks the same. So it has only one orientation. But dumbbell could be standing up on its end, like this picture here. It could be laying down on its side, like that picture there. Or it could be um, kind of on a diagonal, right? So we've got the x-axis, the y-axis, and this is what's called the z-axis. So um, the orientation just refers to which way the orbital is facing or in which direction it's pointing at any given time. Um, and the higher up you get in terms of shape, the more orientations you have, right? So again, the S orbital has just one orientation. P has three. The D um, orbitals or D shapes have five. F has seven, etc., etc. So obviously the complexity increases as your number of electrons um, increases. The final way we describe electrons is the spin. So electrons behave sort of like a magnet in that they spin, um, and they their direction of spin is a constant. It doesn't change. It can only either spin in two possible directions that are opposite of one another, and we represent those two directions by using arrows um, for whatever reason. The person who first came up with this um, notation chose an up arrow and a down arrow. And so whenever two electrons, so say we have two electrons up here in this s orbital, whenever there are two electrons within a particular orbital, they always spin in opposite directions. Um, and so if there's only one electron, we always say that it's spinning in the up direction. Um, not until there are two do we represent both the up and down direction. And we'll do a lot of practicing with this, so don't panic if it doesn't make sense yet. Um, so we can we often describe atoms in terms of their electron configuration. So remember that every atom has its own atomic number, which is the number of protons, and that's equal to the neutral atom has the same number of electrons, which because each proton number is unique, each electron number is also unique. And um, so it's important to know that in nature, in all natural processes, um, matter tries to be in balance. So at the atomic level, that means that electrons will be in the lowest energy state possible. That makes them the most stable and the most balanced. And so um, as you are describing an electron configuration, we always start by placing electrons into the lowest principal energy levels, and then we go, we fill the orbitals and the energy levels um, by whichever is the least energetic, and then we just go to the next least and the next least. It's sort of like taking the stairs one at a time, right? You can't skip from the bottom stair to the very top stair of a large staircase. It's just not possible. It's the same thing with electrons. They can't fill such opposite um, energy levels. They will always fill the lowest first. So let's look at um, what that would mean. That leads us to kind of the rules of writing an electron configuration, and I just mentioned this first one, right? Electrons will always occupy the lowest level available. I think of this like a skyscraper. When you're building a skyscraper, say a 50-story apartment building. You can't start building at the top. You have to start building at the bottom and then build the next level and then the next level and then the next level, etc. It's the same thing with with um, electron configurations. You always fill the lowest energy levels, then the next lowest, then the next lowest, etc, etc. This is called the Aufbau principle, and it's not named for a person. Rather, it's named for um, a German word that means to construct or to build. So it goes right along with our skyscraper example. Um, our second rule is that no two electrons can have the same electron configuration. Um, so what that means is if we have two electrons, well, let's say um, we have two electrons in our first energy level, so our one for first energy in orbital S, the spherical shaped orbital, 
if we have two electrons in there, then they have to have opposite spins because they can't both be up. It's not possible to have the exact same um, energy level and shape and orientation and spin. Um, this is a principle um, a gentleman by the name of Polly came up with, and actually he named it in a, quite a simple way, fortunately. It's called the Polly Exclusion Principle, and so it means that if we already have one electron spinning in this direction, the up direction, then the other electron must be spinning in the opposite direction. Um, and we have a lot of testing to show us this, but it keeps the electron um, cloud balanced, basically, and it, it, the electrons don't exist if they're spinning in the same direction or it's not the way that it, it happens in nature. Um, our third rule is that much like the spin, electrons want to be as far away from one another as possible. Remember that they have opposite, or they have, um, they all have negative charges. Like charges repel. So negative repels other negative. So they want to be as far apart as, as is physically possible. But remember that they're both or all attracted by this large positive nucleus. So they can only get so far away. Um, but they will fill, let's say we're looking at, um, I'm running out of space here, but we're looking at an electron that's going to fill all three of these these p-shaped orbitals. We've got a bunch of electrons. They are going to fill, one electron will fill here, and the second one will fill this next one, and the third one will fill that one, before any of them will double up in the same um, pathway. So think of this like if we had uh, multiple dog runs and we had a group of dogs. Think of it as each dog would want their own run before any dogs would want to share. So if you had your own opportunity at your own space, the electrons will take that opportunity before they will double up and share space uh, with any other electron. This, um, this rule or this principle was named for a gentleman named Hund, and so this is called Hund's rule. So finally, I just wanted to show you some examples of what electron configuration looks like. So for instance, if we are looking at um, the periodic table, I started with aluminum. I don't know why I started there. I just did. Aluminum has 2, 4, 10, 12, 13 electrons. Aluminum's atomic number is 13, so it has 13 electrons. And so we write the locations of each of those electrons, in which energy level they would be, and then in which orbital they would be found in, and then how many electrons fill each orbital. So it looks something like this, and again, these should have um, exponents, but the conversion to this video software doesn't allow it. Um, so we have, in the 1s orbital, we have two electrons, which is the most that can be held in that sphere. Right, it can only hold two electrons of opposite spins. Then we have to go up to the next energy level, which is energy level two. And again, the simplest shape is S. So then we've got another two electrons spinning in opposite directions. So one S2, two S2. And then we still have um, nine electrons that have to be accounted for. So the next energy level, we're still in energy level two, but the next um, shape that is possible are the p orbitals. So we've got our three p orbitals facing in different directions, and we put an electron here, and an electron here, and an electron here, and then we go back and fill in. Another one there, another one there, another one there, all in opposite spins. So we say that there are six electrons in the 2p level, so now we're up to 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Um, the next energy level is 3. So again, the easiest, um, the lowest energy, or the lowest shape is the s shape. So we've got our two opposite spinning electrons in the 3s2. And then we have one lone electron left. So there's just one electron in one of these p orientations. It's not really possible to know which of the p orientations, but one of these p orientations has the last electron. And so that is our full um, electron configuration. 
Remember that at the one level, there's only one shape, so we just have an S. At the two level, there's two shapes, both S and P. At the three level, there would be three shapes if we needed more um, orbitals for electrons. Then we would go to the next level up, um, and we'll talk about that as we go further, but I just wanted you to kind of see how this would work. Um, there are tons and tons of information and practice problems on pages 113 to 121. I would strongly encourage you to look those over because we're going to talk about them and do a bunch more practice in class. I would also encourage you to try and write the electron configurations for these three atoms, these three elements, and we will see how you do when we get to class. I will see you soon.